Um, first, I want to bring you greetings from two of the organisations which are sponsoring this evening. And first of all, the Haldane Society of Socialist Lawyers, of which I'm the International Secretary. These chambers are where we presently have our headquarters. Um, Liz Davis, who a member of these chambers, is our chair. And we're very much involved in uh, Turkish and Kurdish issues, as I will explain. Also, greetings from the European Lawyers for Democracy and Human Rights, of which I'm the president. We're in 19 countries in Europe, organizations and individuals. And our Turkish sister organization is the Cehade, the Progressive Lawyers of Turkey. And although this evening's meeting is on peace in, with the Kurds in Turkey, I, I think it would be uh, a problem not to mention the trials presently going on. So on the one hand, there are talks with Öcalan, as uh, we will hear, and a greater possibility for peace than there has been for some time, and a real basis for getting uh, the PKK taken off the terrorist list at the various levels. At the same time, the regime is really smashing into uh, civil society and lawyers in particular. There are three different trials going on presently. Melanie has been observing one of them. <clears throat> we have observers going out on a regular basis from various uh, member organizations of um, ELTH. Uh, we've just had a demonstration outside the Turkish embassy in Berlin uh, with a large number of lawyers in their robes. Uh, really very serious situation indeed. So that is also part of the background. <clears throat> um, another organization not officially sponsoring but um, very much involved is the Bar Human Rights Committee of England and Wales. And I was a founder of it 20 years ago and on the executive committee. And Melanie actually was out as, uh, with a mandate from the Bar Human Rights Committee. And over the years, a lot of us have been working on taking cases against Turkey at the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. And personally, I've taken about 45 cases during the 1990s <coughs> um, with the Kurdish Human Rights Project. So there's really been, I think, quite a considerable engagement over the years. But I don't want to take time away from our speakers who have very kindly agreed to speak for no more than eight minutes each, so I'm going to be keeping tabs on them <coughs> and uh, interrupting if necessary. That's so that there will be the maximum time for questions and discussion. Also, if you can very surreptitiously have a look at the appeal, which should be on all of your chairs, and we're going to be adopting the appeal this evening. And uh, Gareth Pierce cannot be with us. She has a prisoner in Belmarsh, prison. And one of the things with Gareth Pierce is that her uh, clients in these situations always take priority. So when you book Gareth for a meeting, there is always the very strong possibility that she will be in prison, uh, not with us. And that is the case uh, this evening. But she's promised she is going to be the first signatory of this appeal. So please have a look at that. First speaker this evening is going to be Dr. Uslam Galip, and she did her PhD at the Center for Kurdish Studies at University of Exeter. She's co-authored a book entitled Kurt Romani Okuma Kilavuzu, a companion to Kurdish novels. Uh, she's UK correspondent of the Kurdish newspaper Yeni Uzgur Politika, and she works at University of Oxford as a researcher and lecturer. Thank you. Before starting my speech about the ongoing process uh, between Turkish state and PKK, um, I would like to touch upon the protest begun in um, Istanbul, spreading all over Turkey and Kurdistan in the last four weeks. Um, by chance, uh, I was happened to be there in the first uh, week of the protest and witnessed actually how naive um, small protest led to violent clashes due, due to the raids and the attacks of Turkish police forces. Um, Again, I was there. On the morning of 28th May, around 50 protesters were camp camping out in Gezi Park in order to prevent its demolition. 
the protesters, with the help of uh, BDP MP uh, Sirri Süreyya Endes, attempted to stop the authorities uh, to bulldoze the park by refusing to leave. Uh, police threw water cannons and tear gas used violence to end the protest, and the protest left four dead and 5,000 inju injured, as far as I know. And despite the common thoughts, it's not just the Kemalists who are now expressing their rage at the Turkish Prime Minister. According to a research conducted by Istanbul Bilgi University, more than um, two-thirds of the protesters do not have any ties uh, with any political party. More than half have never participated in any mass demonstration. And nine out of ten surveyed said that what had propped prompted them to demonstrate was Erdogan's authoritarian style of governing, police violence, and the violation of democratic rights. Instead of trying to understand the reasons of the protests, Erdogan has treated the protests as a conspiracy of foreign powers, which doesn't have any grounds. The protests reflect a good uh, mirror of Turkey's, um, Turkey society, which voiced anger towards AKP's um, 10 years of authoritarian system. It also shows that Turkish state can no longer continue its politics framed by one language, one religion, and one flag. These protests have en an enabled common action by people of different ideological, class attachment, and religious and ethnic backgrounds in Turkey, which is highly divided along ethnic, religious, and sociocultural lines. I believe that the recent protests are important in terms of redefining Turkey's democratic culture. The lack of coverage of the protests by the mainstream Turkish media generated awareness within the protesters against brutal events taking place in Kurdish cities which were not covered by Turkish media, such as the uh, Roboski massacre. People have begun to raise questions about the media's role in forming a negative cultural mindset in Turkey not least against the Kurds. So therefore, I believe that uh, the protests have that empathy within the Kurds, so within the protesters <coughs> towards Kurds, who have been subjected to discrimination and massacres for years. Now there's a crucial question, which is, um, what consequences will they have on the historic, ongoing Kurdish peace process? Personally, I think it was an unfortunate that such mass protests erupted at a time when the government was in an attempt to resolve Kurdish issue as, as all attention has been drawn to the protests rather than the, the peace and democracy, uh, democracy conference taking place on 15 and 16 June in the Arbakar. Um, and I also believe that it's important to concentrate on the demands resulted from this conference as the demands have been mentioned before in so many other occasions. So uh, the demands uh, raised during the conference in Diyarbakir can be considered as a clear answer for those who still do not know what Kurds really want. Because I still hear you know, such rhetoric questions like what Kurds really want. So the two-day conference in Diyarbakir ended with a declaration listing the demands <coughs> of Kurds, including the freedom of Abdullah Jalan, the special autonomous status for North Kurdistan, the conference called on the creation of a democratic constitution for Turkey, a formative action for the region, calling on economic incentives and financial stimulus for the Kurdish region, and it demanded the release of political prisoners. It further demanded an end to discrimination against women at all levels and an end to state policies threatening the well-being of Turkey's um, Armenians, Syriacs, Arabs, Turkmen, and other religious groups such as Christian, Jews, and SED, Alevi, and others. <laughs> Sticking to its promises, PKK released eight Turkish captives um, in March 2013 and started silently to withdraw to South Kurdistan on the 8th of May 2013. However, it should be noted that uh, Kurdish guerrillas are giving up their armed struggle, but not their demands. They are simply hoping to achieve them by peaceful means. Despite the hopes and commitments from Kurdish side, however, the silence of Turkish government and in inconsistent remarks of Erdogan by using head terrorists for uh, Mr. Öcalan during public speeches create more obstacles challenge challenging the uneasy journey <coughs> towards <coughs> peace. 
Erdogan has also been criticized for not revealing the measures of his side agreed to in exchange for the Gala ceasefire and their withdrawal. Even BDP co-chair Selahattin Demirtas has recently said that the peace process faced the risk of deadlock because of the practices of the ruling AKP government. Furthermore, two weeks ago, PKK Commander Karayolan said the peace process had now reached a critical stage at which the government must take its own steps as uh, the PKK withdrew. He added his comments uh, could be taken as warning. But Abdullah Jalan released a statement a few days ago <coughs> saying the peace process had now arrived at its second phase. BDP deputies um, released Öcalan's message, which started off assuring the continuation of the process following their visit to Imbrella Island a, a few days ago. However, during the meeting with Wise People Commission and Erdogan on the other day, Erdogan has also signaled uh, no withdraw uh, withdrawal uh, of Turkey's 10% um, election threshold, which also saying that the mother tongue education was off the agenda. And these were among the core demands of the BDP and um, even uh, PKK. So we see that Erdogan has not changed his rhetoric since his first rule. In this respect, then, what is all about peace process then? The suspicions against the sincerity of AKP government within some Kurds are based on the memories of the negotiated 1999 withdrawal when tens of PKK <coughs> guerrillas were killed despite the assurances given by the government. The Wise People Commission designated by the government itself to debate the settlement process with PKK in seven geographical regions of Turkey has concluded that a new civilian democratic constitution is needed for a permanent solution to the problem. However, whether Erdogan's government will take such feedbacks regarding the current constitution in the consideration is an enigma. On the whole, the Kurds and their supporters' right to life right to freedom from torture and human tr in, in, in human treatment, right to liberty, right to fair trial, right to freedom of expression, freedom of assembly and association, and right to freedom of press are routinely violated in Turkey as noted in the reports prepared by European Commission and International Crisis Group uh, to name a few. Taking measures to increase the degree of st state intervention <coughs> in personal, social and political matters has also been much more visible in Turkey. The government have been escaping human rights duties by using excuse of suppressing activities, anti-terrorist actions, etc. Egemen Bush, Minister of EU Affairs, announced that the Gezi protesters will be treated as terrorists. The approach of Erdogan towards Gezi Park protests also does not promise more democracy, freedom and tolerance will flourish in Turkey. The peace between two sides not only depends on an agreement between the government and the PKK, but also on Turkey's formation, uh, Turkey's formation of democracy in the Middle East. There can't be a proper uh, peace unless civil society organizations and groups are consulted and made a part of it. Despite their significance, <coughs> NGOs are still considered as illegitimate. Again, EU, which could play a crucial role in the country's democratization, has taken a step back, missing its chance of being a facilitator in this long-standing conflict. The road towards democratic coexistence is open, but the way still remains uphill. Peace process should be encouraged and supported by the international bodies. The bans on PKK in Europe should be lifted with an immediate uh, effect. And then 2013 will be remembered as the turning point on the road to long-lasting long peace in Turkey and Kurdistan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ursula. <clears throat> Our second speaker is Professor Michael Gunter. <clears throat> He's Professor of Political Science at Tennessee Technological University. And he teaches in many places, including just recently in London, in England. And he's written many books, and he's got, actually he's borrowed from a person for whom he's just written a dedication, uh, his own book, um, The Kurds Awakening. There you are, in its second edition. And he's Secretary General of the EU-Turkey Civil Commission, and uh, it's really good to have him here with us this evening. Thank you, Bill. 
And thank you all for coming out. I bring greetings from the United States. We don't have a whole lot of Kurds in the United States, but uh, the largest gathering of them are near where I live in Nashville, Tennessee, maybe 10,000 Kurds. And uh, we have a Kurdish National Congress of North America organization that was uh, created back in the late 1980s, and we just had its annual meeting in um, Nashville, Tennessee, and I was able to attend it. I've been on the road now since June 1st. I was first in Tbilisi, Georgia, where I discovered that the flag of Georgia is identical to the flag of England, cross of St. George on a white field, although uh, they have a cross in each one of the quadrants in the Georgian flag. Well, I can tell you that I talked for more than an hour with you know, Chivikas, the Turkish ambassador to the UK two days ago, and I thought I'd uh, share some of uh, uh, his <coughs> thoughts with you today. Uh, you might ask, why did I get to talk to him? Well, 38 years ago he was my student when I taught at <laughs> Middle East Technical University in Ankara, Turkey, and uh, he remembered his old professor and uh, his wife was my student too, but I didn't get to meet her. She's, uh, he told me though, his wife is the honorary chairwoman of the British Turkish Federation. So I asked him about the demonstrations and I, I was impressed that uh, he was uh, candid and forthcoming. I asked him about the recent demonstrations in uh, Turkey and he uh, said that Erdogan has become too authoritarian. And he also told me, he blamed uh, uh, the escalation on police brutality. And then I shot back to him, uh, well, uh, aren't your, isn't your government responsible for the actions of the police? And uh, he sort of said, yes, that's true. He told me the demonstrations are dying out now. Uh, I cannot help but remember, well, I'm old, maybe some of you remember too, uh, in 1968 in France, General de Gaulle uh, was faced with, uh, with a tremendous uh, amount of demonstrations in Paris in May 1968, and he waited out the demonstrations, called elections, won the biggest majority in French political history, and seemed like he had triumphed and everything, but nine months later, General de Gaulle had to resign as president of France. I am saying that it seems to me Erdogan might have been mortally wounded by these demonstrations. It may not be clear immediately how weak he has become, but uh, I, I'm saying that it may well be that in a year or so Erdogan will find his po position untenable, and uh, well, we'll wait and see. But I'm not so sure that uh, Erdogan uh, will get out of this uh, unsc unscathed. Now, how about the PKK peace process? Uh, the ambassador told me this is going to take more time than many think. Uh, but he had a reasonable amount of optimism. Uh, he told me, for example, that unlike in 2000, when the PKK was withdrawing from Turkey after Ocalan's capture, and that many PKK guerrillas were getting killed by Turkish military, uh, he said that this time, the Turkish military is avoiding the PKK as the uh, withdrawal. And it seems to me that is happening. I have not heard about uh, any clashes between the Turkish army and PKK as the PKK withdraws into northern Iraq. Uh, he, the ambassador did tell me that it is the duty of the Turkish army, uh, if it sees enemies of the state, which the PKK is, uh, to go after them. And so it's a difficult situation legally, but uh, uh, apparently the army, the Turkish army is avoiding the PKK, which I think is a positive thing. Uh, one problem, of course, is the weapons. The Turkish government wants the PKK to uh, give up its weapons as a first opening round here, and then uh, be disarmed. <laughs> And the PKK has the opposite position. It wants to keep its arms until the peace process is successful. So what is the compromise here? Uh, I suggested to him that uh, 
maybe the decommissioning of IRA arms in Northern Ireland, the British experience in Northern Ireland was a model to follow. Uh, and the ambassador suggested that uh, maybe the United States could be the neutral party that would oversee the decommissioned weapons. Uh, Ojalan did say some things to me. As a matter of fact, I'm passing uh, photographs around. Where are they? Uh, yeah, if I can have them back at the end. Not now. These are photographs that I took when I visited Ojalan in March 1998 in uh, Syria. I met with him for two days. One day in his apartment in Damascus, second day at a PKK military camp somewhere outside of Damascus. And we had long-ranging talks, and I also played volleyball with him, and I played football with him. Your football, not my football. Soccer, what we call soccer. And uh, one thing I remember very clearly about Ojalan is that he and I were facing each other in a volleyball game. We were on, other, we were on opposite sides, and Ojalan went up for a kill, and he slammed the ball down, but missed. He missed by about a half an inch, and everybody was, afraid to say anything. Nobody said out or in or anything like that. And a moment of silence, and Ojalan said out. He called the ball out on himself. And I was impressed with that because I have played tennis and many other sports, and people are always cheating when I play with them. They're always <laughs> saying out when it's in or in when it's out. And I was impressed that this man was honest. Now, of course, maybe he... Uh, knew that I saw it was out and he was trying to impress me. But still, my overall impression, and, and I'm an American, I'm supposed to hate Ojalan and hate the PKK, it's a terrorist organization, and, uh, but my overall impression of Ojalan after I met him, and has always been of a, uh, of a, of a deep-thinking intellectual person who, of course, has uh, experience leading a, uh, a guerrilla outfit. Uh, Ojalan, when I talked to him, s said, yes, we have used terrorist methods. We have made mistakes and we've used terrorist methods. But if you study history, you will see the real terrorist is the Kurdish state, is the Turkish state, is the Turkish state and how it has treated Kurds over the years. Anyway, uh, when I was talking to the ambassador a couple days ago, uh, the Turkish ambassador, you know, Chivikas, told me that a couple years ago he shook hands with Martin McGuinness, the uh, former IRA leader, and the Turkish ambassador told me he was thinking to himself at that time that I wonder if someday I will be shaking hands with Abdullah Ocalan. And uh, I said, I think that's true. I, uh, I predicted 10 years ago that Ocalan would become a Turkish statement uh, Turkish statesman, and I, I think this is happening, but the uh, ambassador told me this is not going to be soon. Uh, Turkey is not going to delist the PKK as a terrorist organization in the near future. Turkey is not going to uh, move Ojalan to some type of uh, house arrest, uh, but uh, in, in the near future, but th this might come in, 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 later. Uh, overall, I am reasonably optimistic about the peace process, but I'm not predicting that it will be successful immediately. Uh, but even if it fails in the short run, it will be an experience that we can build upon, and we are certainly seeing, as the title of my book, The Kurds Ascending, says, uh, the Kurds are ascending. And the title of my next book is tentatively, The Kurds Empowered. Uh, no longer victims. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, third speaker is Melanie Gingle. Gingle. Yeah, Gingle. Gingle. Um, and Melanie's practiced at the British Bar for 20 years. Um, she's now an associate tenant at Dowdy Street Chambers in London. She's a visiting fellow at London South Bank University where she lectures on International Human Rights Law and Feminist Legal Theory. Um, she's on the advisory board of the Gulf Center for Human Rights in Beirut. And she's carried out field missions and trial observations um, in the region and elsewhere. And in particular, what I've seen recently from Melanie is her excellent reports 
from <coughs> trial observations in the Istanbul Heavy Penal Court and the trial of the Kurdish lawyers. And she went there, I'm proud to say, on behalf of the Bar Human Rights Committee of England and Wales. Thank you. <clears throat> on the 10th of October 2011, Gabriella Noor, who is the United Nations Special Rapporteur for the Independence of Judges and Lawyers, visited Turkey. She reported that there was an increasing attack on lawyers through the judicial process. She spent approximately a week in Turkey and she found many things about the judicial system there that were very concerning. But one of her greatest concerns was that lawyers were increasingly the focus of, of attack. They were being identified with their clients so that any lawyers who dared to represent political clients, and in particular Kurdish political, political clients, were being arrested and charged with terrorism-related offences. So that was in October 2011. And what was Turkey's response to this criticism at really the very highest level? Well, almost exactly one month to the day after that report, uh, 46 Kurdish lawyers were arrested in one fell swoop. They're all members of the Istanbul Bar Association. So in other words, the Turkish government responded with a massive attack on, on the legal profession, flying in the face, really, of what um, the UN had, had said. And we know that that... Um, attack was part, was part of a much broader attack on, on the Kurdish community uh, using the judici judicial system. We know that hundreds of Kurdish activists are now languishing in pre-trial detention uh, for up to 20 months in the case of some of these lawyers in, in the trial that I've been observing. Uh, and thousands, literally thousands of Kurdish activists are facing prosecution for terrorism um, offences. Uh, I know that we have someone who's been uh, observing a trial of journalists. Those journalists are being attacked, uh, trade unionists, uh, polit politicians and academics. So it's a very broad range attack on, on Kurdish activists. If this sort of attack on lawyers uh, who dare to represent political defendants was replicated here in the UK, um, approximately a third of my chambers would be in pre-trial detention now because that's what they specialise in. Um, several members of our panel would, if Gareth had been here, she would have been somebody who definitely would be in prison. Um, and Ali perhaps would also be in prison and certainly my husband would be in prison. So I can relate to this um, attack on quite a personal level. I've been observing the hearings in this trial of lawyers since November of last year. I hadn't been involved in Kurdish issues prior to that and I had very little knowledge of Turkish politics. So it's been a very steep learning curve for me over the last few months to understand how this could happen uh, and how an apparently modern and functioning legal system could be harnessed to this extent and involved in, a, in an attack of these proportions on a minority within its country. How can the legal system justify this? How is it articulated into a legal discourse? Well, the answer seems to be that it all comes back to Ataturk. In Taksim Square now, following the, the very, very violent protests that we've seen in recent times, there's a new strategy. People are now standing silently in the square in protest, and they appear to be communing with an enormous portrait of Ataturk, which is on a, a piece of um, fabric which covers almost the entire building at the end of the square, and they're standing focusing on, on his portrait. Um, when we were there um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we saw the, the standing protest. Um, what we noticed was mm -hmm. that there are very few, if any, Kurds involved in this um, communing with Ataturk process that seems to be going on. Because it was he, of course, who began the process of Turkification. It was he who, with very, very broad strokes, created the new Turkish state in 1923. And one of the founding principles was an anti-diversity ideology which sprang from the fear that it was the, the plural, plurality of the Ottoman Empire 
which had greatly contributed to its collapse and its defeat. And it was believed that the strength would be gained through unity and that everyone in Turkey had to be Turkish, and that's now, of course, enshrined in, in the Constitution, and that everyone should be equal. But in the, the Turkish legal system, the notion of equality and fairness is understood to be sameness. To assert any difference, to assert your identity as a Kurd or as any other minority, is seen as being in opposition to the nation, the Turkish nation, and even to the concept of human rights. For example, there are, I'm told, no examples of Turks being prosecuted under the race legislation for offences against the Kurds, but that same race legislation is frequently used against the Kurdish um, population. The promotion of Kurdish rights in Turkey equals a racist propaganda in their eyes. The promotion of rights for Kurds to use their own Kurdish names or to seek to be educated in Kurdish is perceived as a racist um, strand. This mindset is incredibly deeply embedded in Turkish society. It runs very deep and it's very difficult to see how that is going to be countered. So in observing these hearings, it's become very clear that the process is a political one and has actually very little to do with justice. It seems that, that even a pretense of a fair judicial process has been abandoned. At each hearing, a group of defendants is released on bail. At the most recent hearing last week, seven people were released. No reasons were given uh, for those releases. Nothing had changed. The evidence remained exactly the same as it had done throughout the entire process. And indeed, no reasons were ever given uh, for the failure to grant bail to these people in the first place. These defendants are all professional people with strong community ties, with young families, uh, in Istanbul. Some of them even return from business abroad to face the charges. So it's very difficult to see how any pre-trial detention could possibly be justified within the law. The failure to give reasons for these decisions is in breach of Turkish domestic law. Uh, the reasons for release do not seem to emanate from within the courtroom, but from the wider political process. It seems to relate possibly to uh, the peace process. Uh, the defendants themselves have characterised themselves as hostages in a political process rather than as defendants in a trial, and that those sort of submissions form the basis of, what the spe how, of how the speeches are set out in court. It's reported in the media that the KCK trials are on the agenda within the peace talks, and many people believe that a positive resolution to this crisis can only be achieved through that political process and not through the trial. While we've been observing the hearings over the last six months, we have seen some small gains. For example, right at the beginning of this year, a new law was passed enabling Kurds to use the Kurdish language in court. Uh, and we witnessed the first time that Kurdish defendants were allowed to defend themselves in their own language. So that was quite a momentous occasion. Uh, secondly, an amendment is, I understand, going through uh, the, the, the Parliament at the moment, which will amend laws about freedom of speech, which it is anticipated will mean that some of the KCK defendants will be released, um, possibly some journalists, um, not the lawyers, uh, because they are charged with membership of an organisation, not just um, speech-related crimes. On the other hand, despite this more positive outlook, um, bad things are still happening. More lawyers have been arrested on similarly political uh, charges. On the 18th of January, 15 more lawyers were arrested. So it's clearly not over. Um, Interestingly, during the, the violent protests that we've seen recently, um, a group of lawyers was arrested uh, while uh, giving a press, issuing a press release in court. Um, perhaps we're seeing a tactic that was used against the Kurds being transferred to a, a broader uh, picture. This might also explain why these lawyers who were arrested in the, in the context of the protests were released almost immediately because not being used as hostages in this wider 
political process. So in summary, in relation to these trials, the, we, the legal observers, found that there are multiple flagrant breaches of internationally agreed fair trial standards. Um, the details of those breaches are set out in our trial observation reports, which are on the Peace in Kurdistan website and on the Bar Human Rights Committee website. But in brief, the judges are not impartial. They rarely call on the prosecutor to express a view, um, as it's fairly apparent that the judge and the prosecutor have a shared view. Uh, the court has abandoned, as I say, all pretense at conducting a fair trial, as evidenced by the failure to give any reasons for their decisions as required by domestic law, and by failing to even consider excluding illegally obtained evidence. A lot of evidence was obtained through illegal wiretapping and so on. There's no equality of arms. The prosecution and the judge sit on the bench together. Uh, they enter and leave through the same door. Defence counsel sit in the well of the court at the same level as the defendant. So clearly the, the judges and the um, prosecutor have a chance to discuss matters uh, in the absence of the, of the defence uh, behind the court. At one point, the judge even said that he would consider the defendant's arguments when he came to sentence him. So, <laughs> there is absolutely no concept of innocent, being innocent until proven guilty. It's totally a foregone conclusion as accepted by the judge in that remark. So, in conclusion, the international community needs to keep the pressure on the Turkish government. We need to have a strong presence at these trials. Um, we hope, however, that the peace process will be successful uh, and that at least uh, we'll see some justice for these defendants as a result of that process and for the whole community, even if, as seems very clear, there, there is not going to be any justice uh, resulting from these trials. Thank you, Melanie. I don't think Ali Haas is here. Um, he's my student, but he's also a practicing lawyer. So he's probably at a police station with a client or something like that at this moment. <clears throat> uh, final speaker is Barry White, who's been a member of the National Union of Journalists since 1982. He was a full-time trade union official for quite a few years, member of the NEC of the National Union of Journalists, and he's a member presently of the European Federation of Journalists. He's the national organizer for the Campaign for Press and Broadcasting Freedom, and he's a freelance journalist. Thank you. Um, and I've also got to leave just after 8 o'clock, so apologies um, to go up north. Um, can I say how much I've learnt from the previous speakers? Um, like one of them, I, I'm a fairly newcomer to Turkish politics, to the Kurdish movement, uh, and to what's been going on uh, against journalists and other workers in Turkey for expressing opinions which don't seem to exactly coincide with that of what is becoming increasingly an authoritarian government. And can I say express amazement at, at our American colleague um, over his interpretation of the, the attitude of the ambassador. I, I was outside the embassy in Belgrade Square on Friday afternoon at a demonstration at which the uh, TUC General Secretary tried to deliver a letter to the ambassador, perhaps saying some of the things that you actually said to him. Um, she rang the bell along with the delegation and rang the bell and rang the bell and no one came and knocked on the door and the door remained closed. And in the end, they had to leave. Nobody from the embassy was prepared to meet the General Secretary of the Trade Union Congress and the delegation to even talk about the situation which is of increasing concern to us all. Um, can I also say that um, the last speaker talked about the use of Kurdish in the courts as one of the uh, legal reforms that was enacted earlier on. And a colleague from the European Federation of Journalists who was covering the KCK trial the week before last actually witnessed this for the first time. Um, of course, there had to be an interpreter for the, for the judges, three of them, who didn't understand a word of what was being said, of course. Um, 
but nevertheless, uh, it, it, it's a step forward, uh, quite a big one, I think, to uh, Kurdish people and, and the Kurdish journalists and others who are in court. But nevertheless, uh, I share with her the interpretation of the farce which passes for a judicial process uh, in the cases of these trials, whether it's journalists, teachers, uh, lawyers, or, or other workers who found themselves uh, brought before uh, the courts. Um, and as you may know from a previous little talk I gave here, the European Federation of Journalists, of which I am a representative on from the National Union of Journalists in the United Kingdom, has been campaigning for many years for the release of all journalists who are currently in prison or facing trial for, for doing no more than what is their jobs. Uh, and although the EFJ doesn't take a position on the question of the peace process, I, I welcome it and obviously hope that it will lead to the release of all journalists. The majority of them may well be Kurds, but a lot of them aren't. Uh, but the ones who are Kurds, Kurd, uh, Kurds um, have been quite clearly, like the others, facing judicial harassment. And after all, many of them are charged with so-called crimes under the draconian anti-terror laws. And if these laws are relaxed as a result of the peace process, it could help improve the climate for freedom of expression and the right to report. But on the other hand, we have to remember that given the structure and ownership of the press and other media in Turkey and their relationship with the government and to the government, more radical measures will be needed. And as is pointed out in uh, this leaflet, The Appeal, uh, we could, in fact, as a result of recent events, face more repression, not less. So while the peace talks represent a significant breakthrough, although they are relatively young, this phase anyway, the recent events in Turkey, more especially in Taksim Square and Gezi Park, have proved a watershed for the domestic media. And this has not gone unnoticed by thousands of people. In Turkey, as you may well know, media are divided into two unequal groups. The largest are all owned by the major corporations, bankers, financiers, engineers, businesses, all dependent on the government for contracts and favours. Not for them the freedom of expression and holding power to account. To them, media is just another business. The media tycoons and bosses have decided that doing business with the government is more profitable than doing their job, which is informing the people about what is going on. On the other side, up against them, is a small independent network, or small independent networks, who kept the cameras rolling and the reporters out there but they soon came under attack from the authorities. These are the journalists and photographers, filmmakers who reported in the public interest. Many, but for their, for their pains, many of, of them were attacked by the police, tear gassed and arrested. In addition, some of their news outlets were, were fined by the media regulator for, quotes, harming the physical, moral and mental development of children and young people. And that's because they showed what was going on. And I think even by our standards, that's quite incredible. But that's not all. Social media, Twitter, Facebook, have come under attack from the Prime Minister, who has threatened to investigate social media and national media, publishing photos on the demonstrations, and also to investigate violence against the police. Andrew Gardner, the Turkey researcher for Amnesty International, recently commented, the significant difference with the current events is that the censorship has affected a different constituency of people, mainly middle-class Turks, rather than other groups whose causes have been more frequently subjected to censorship, such as activists advocating Kurdish rights and politics. End of quote. So a fast lear learning curve for many of those recently involved in the demonstrations. Now, let's turn to the man at the center of the peace process, the Prime Minister. 
because he seems to be waging war on a significant section of the population who object to his desire to micromanage their lives. He's also declared war on the foreign media, by the way. He has called the demonstrators traitors and has recently been party to an attack on the BBC to which the global news director, Peter Horrocks, issued a statement this week that the BBC was very concerned by the continued campaign of the Turkish authorities to discredit the BBC and intimidate journalists. A large number of threatening messages had been, received, had be, had been sent to one of their reporters, and there's a threatening message to me which says one minute. Um, and one must remember that it's now the Turkish news service that's now under attack, both from the mayor of Ankara and from the prime minister himself. And this sends out a chilling message to all journalists. Be careful what you say and do, or you could be next. Let me just finish on, on, on a final point about the way I, I, I'm worried about what's happening with the peace, pro peace progress and, the, and because of the reaction to what's happened. Um, first of all, what you need to do from the lessons from Northern Ireland and, and, and the British is to build a consensus within the, within the, within the, the political framework. For instance, I, I, in Britain, all the political parties in Parliament backed the, uh, the, the, the initiative in, 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 the, in Northern Ireland. That doesn't exist in, in the Turkish Parliament. Uh, and this week, for instance, we saw the final meeting of what's called the, the Wise Persons Council, or Wise Men's Council, uh, which was set up by the government to assist in the bid to find a peaceful solution to the Kurdish issues and build public support for the process. Now, two members refused to attend the regional meeting in Istanbul because of the Prime Minister's handling of the protests in his country. And it's clear, as I said, that opposition parties in Parliament are not behind this initiative because of perhaps, well, for, for a number of reasons. But the point is, the Prime Minister doesn't do consensus. It's not in his... He wouldn't let the ball go over the line and call in. Or that's, that's not the way he operates. So I think there are serious problems ahead, made worse by his handling of opposition voices. Um, his, his view is, his slogan is, you are either for or against me. That's not the basis to take the peace process forward something we all want to, want to see in order to get justice for the Kurdish people. Meanwhile, like, like the previous speaker, my union and the International Federation of Journalists will keep attending these, these so-called trials of journalists until they are all released. Thank you.